Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. And we're doing this live with Jeff Fritz. He's hosting us today. Hi, Jeff. Hey, how's it going? Yeah. little Twitch action. Oh, yeah. Trying something new. This is going to be good, and we want to talk all about it, but we, we got to go through our regular .NET Rocks gobbledygook first, including a little banter. Hi, Richard. Hey, man. How you doing? That was enough for me. All right, let's move on. All right, let's move on. <laughs> to better know, <laughs> better know a framework. Roll, roll the music. All right, buddy, what do you got? Well, I've just been finding some really cool tweets that have videos attached to them, and this is no different. This is Mike Alger. If you go to 1575.pwop.me, You'll see Weekend Project. By combining a 3D scan with an MRI, don't worry, I'm fine, I can now step out of my body and legitimately look into my head at my own brain. That video is awesome. How cool is that? That is pretty cool. Very clever. Yeah, it's a 3D model of him in his head, and then when it gets really close, you know, kind of like how Google Maps and Bing Maps morph into like a satellite view when you get really close. It just goes inside his brain, inside his head, and shows his brain. Very, very cool. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good one. And the 3D model is oddly creepy. Like, just, you know, it's an actual scan of a person, and it's just like, there's something yep. deeply artificial about that. And I got to thank Joel Hewlin for finding that one and posting it in our Slack channel. Uh, how long before that's just a routine thing that you can just look yeah. through your body like that? I know, it's crazy. It's awesome. It is awesome. It's science science fiction, I tell you. It's Star Trek. There you go. Oh, yeah, look. Jeff is showing it on the live stream. There you go. Yeah. Okay, that's crazy. Isn't it? It's very cool. Mm. Well, that's what I got, Richard. Who's talking to us? Grabbed a comment off of show 1507, the one we did with one Jeff Fritz, right at the beginning of the year, January 2nd, 2018. We were talking about ASP.net in 2018. Right. And by the way, Tana comments on these shows. And of course, Jeff, being the diligent community person that he is, responded to virtually all of them. And I want to grab this particular comment from Steve Ognebene, who's actually been on the show before. Yep. He was a guest on 1149 when he was talking about working with TypeScript. And uh, here's his comment. This is about seven months ago now. Thanks for doing the show, Carl and Richard and Jeff. Yeah, yeah, Jeff Fritz. Of course, I think Jeff, the old Jeff, the editor, <laughs> confused me. I'm so pleased to hear that we will all see some interesting new features in the upcoming Web Forms release. Jeff, you said that in this upcoming version, a developer might be able to, and I'm paraphrasing, pause what's happening, execute some code, and when things are being constructed. I'm very much looking forward to getting more clarity regarding this. First of all, what things? <laughs> are we talking about the fundamental elements of ASP.NET Web Forms, such as context or session, or just user objects? Might this be a feature along the lines of ASP.NET Core middleware? Dare we hope that your plans include adding the features to support what the Web Forms test project dreamed of becoming? Will you be developing this in the open, or will ASP.WebForms remain source open via reference source only? I heard you suggest to the listeners to try turning view state off and see what happens. I wonder if there is a way to write an analyzer for this. Wouldn't that be a nice light bulb to appear in Visual Studio? There are 15 controls on this page that don't need view state turned on. Would you like it if I disabled it for you? That's awesome. Finally, I think your idea for an ebook on modern web forms is an awesome idea, though I expect a sample project on GitHub that is cross referenced with the relevant articles on docs.microsoft.com would be as useful and likely a lot less work. Thanks again for being on the show. Jeff, you replied to this seven months ago. Do you have a new or different reply now? I think we cut a bit of that functionality for being able to intercept at the creation. Right. And it was really the creation, what we were focusing on as we were delivering that feature. And that feature was delivered as part of .NET Framework. I can't remember if it was 471 or 472. But the idea is still the same. When a page or a user control or a custom control or a ASMX, right? One of those SOAP services, SOAP-based web services, or what's the last one? ASHX. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. A handler was being created. You can actually hook that and inject things. You can interact with the constructor at that point. And the, the key thing that people were doing with it that we started putting together was the ability to um, add dependency injection for web forms. And you can right. do that. There are some packages out there. 
that use this new feature, this new functionality, so that you can start to refactor your web forms applications to take advantage of dependency injection, move those resources out, get them into class libraries, .NET standard libraries, so that you can start to reuse them in .NET Core migrations. Mm. This is one of the arguments we had for MVC back in the day, right? Was you couldn't do dependency injection on web forms, that you couldn't separate concerns, you couldn't really build testing harnesses and stuff around it. So yep. the fact that that's starting to creep into web forms freaks me out, actually. So, right, it wasn't a question of we can't do it. We knew exactly where the point was that it needed to be modified. It was just, do we really want to go change this low-level piece of code that was way down in the base. Yeah, I was thinking ISAPI filters, right? Mm. Not even ISAPI, actually. Oh, man. It's, it's not that low. It's in the part where system.web decides to new up things, right? At that point where th that mystical piece of code where it says, oh, create a new web form of this to return. That's what we needed to change. I get it. Okay. Yeah. That might have broken a few things. Yes. Yeah. Tricky stuff to poke around. And it's always interesting to hear the Microsoft team's nervous about code they're not willing to poke around into. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of folks that are nervous about poking at some of that code. So much so that sure. they said, you know what? We're just going to make another framework and we'll call it .NET Core? Maybe. Well, I'm glad they're nervous about that kind of stuff. That's exactly what we want them to be nervous about. Sure. So, Steve, thank you so much for your comment. A copy of Music to Code By is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code By, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Facebook and Google+. And if you comment there and read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code By. And definitely follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet. Jeff reads them all before they... <laughs> I do. Before we do. I probably comments on them, too. <laughs> no. <laughs> not all the time. You were, you were really diligent on that show, man. You went through and responded to a lot of people there. He's our tweet reader. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Fritz, tweet reader. I'm going to make that my title. Yeah. Tweet reader? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Microsoft official tweet reader. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, anyway, let me officially read your bio or just a little bit of it, but everybody knows that you're a senior program manager in DevDiv, working on some of the latest web technologies, including core and everything else. We're going to talk today to you about what you're doing here with this streaming twitchy stuff and maybe uh, get back into some code eventually. Eventually? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for agreeing to do this. This is, this is interesting doing this little bit of crossover here. It is interesting. We've got folks in a chat room that are, that are excited being able to, to see how this is being made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we've got folks uh, watching on the Visual Studio channel of Twitch. We've got folks watching on my channel. And of course, the, all the folks out there listening on the podcast, on the recording, this is great. I, I really appreciate you agreeing to do this. And before we get into anything real, a story. A story. A barbecue story. Yes. All right. So I got a new Traeger smoker slash grill. Okay. Okay. And I smoked the pork butt overnight. <laughs> Almost sounds obscene. As you do. <laughs> but I, I think, yeah, that's, it takes that long to, yeah. to properly smoke pork. Okay. So I, I put it in at midnight and it's seven o'clock this morning. Kelly, my wife, was up and in the backyard, well, on the back porch where the smoker is. And she hears these men talking. She goes down to the end of the deck, and there are police officers there. And they smelled the smoke, and they wondered if our house was on fire. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> you know, that's not how that's supposed to smell. I know, yeah. No, that's much too delicious smelling to be a house on fire. But What kind of wood were you using? Apple. All right. Yeah. That comes across too mild as a flavor. It just sort of smells like smoke. Like if you smoke with hickory, everybody goes, oh, it's hickory. You're making barbecue. Yeah, yeah, sure. And if you smoke with mesquite, then definitely the house is on fire. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that's my barbecue story of dumb. Story yeah. of dumb. Oh, okay. Yep. <laughs> uh, that's a nod to Mark Miller, story of dumb. There you go. Funny, Mark Miller actually said in the chat room, I smoked the pork butt overnight, title of my autobiography. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> All right, enough chit chat. 
I remember you starting to play with Twitch and you and I had a couple of interesting conversations because it didn't go the way you planned. Can you talk about how you got involved and, you know, what happened? Gosh, we were we were at at Vegas for Dev Intersection in the in the fall. Right. Yeah. Was it last only last year? Or was it 2016? Only last year, only 2017. Holy cow. All right. Mm-hmm. I know. It's it's been 9 months I've been doing it. Yeah. And we we had the, this conversation around, you know, hey, our our friend Suze Hinton's doing some really neat things out there with JavaScript programming one day on the weekends showing how some of this stuff is built. Really what, you know, developers build with JavaScript. I started, you know, taking a look at it and I'm like, well, I've got a little bit of a radio voice. This this might be a little bit fun. And this was a case where what happened in Vegas didn't stay in Vegas. <laughs> um <laughs> And I, I, I said, well, I've got, a, I've got a microphone. I've got some of this stuff. You know, nobody's really talking about .NET. Nobody, and, and Twitch is kind of a different environment that not a lot of folks in the .NET community hang out at. Sure, yeah. It's an opportunity to speak to younger folks, to students, but also have that worldwide reach and bring in folks who aren't used to seeing .NET, who aren't used to having that access that that smiling face and we started very simple like you know what let me let me just start writing a little bit of code i started working on a visual studio extension it was something that i had been wanting to do for a while as a web forms developer i thought you know what i've got long compile times yeah so let me write an extension that plays some music during that compile time and i was i was in love with it it was that ear that earworm of the the epic sax guy from the euro music competition right from he was originally from Moldova and it was the European music competition somewhere in Scandinavia, I forget which one, but it was like 2012. And it was this guy playing a sax and it was Eurovision. That's what it was. Thank you, chat room. Ah, okay. And I loved it and I wanted that on loop while my code was being built. That way I could use it at other events and have this funny thing playing in the background. I was thinking yakety sax, but that's just me. I was thinking Kenny G. There you go. <laughs> it looks like Rob Windsor agrees with you, Kenny G. Mm-hmm. So I thought this would be great. This would be a lot of fun to do. And I wired it up and got it, got it working. And, and I started building some things around it online. I was like, well, this isn't too bad. This is kind of fun. And I slowly started building, adding new features. And I was like, well, I'm, I'm not quite somewhere where I'm engaged yet, and, and the folks that are on Mixer might be interesting to engage with, and of course, the boss is called. Right. And Scott said to me, it'd be nice if you could go on Mixer also. Start, so I started broadcasting over there at the same time. Right. And I was like, well, I can't manage two of these streams with some of the tools that are out there. I need to do something to manage both at the same time. So I started writing some tools to manage dual streaming, and then a weird thing happened. I got a pull request and I got a couple more pull requests. Okay, now we're engaging. Now we're seeing folks in the community. Some of the folks that are in the chat room right now, as we're broadcasting here on Twitch, sending some things. Hey, this is a cool suggestion. Why don't you try this or an issue? This doesn't work quite right when I look at your code. Hmm. And that's when I knew I was onto something. At the point that folks started engaging at that level, I'm like, okay, we're getting somewhere. Was the Twitch audience primarily... .NET developers that were also gamers? Like, did you drag all the devs into Twitch or were they there already playing games? There were a number of folks already there, but I'm also seeing some other folks that are that are coming in screaming and yelling. Oh my gosh, what's this Twitch thing? My kids use this to play right. Fortnite. Yeah. And they started joining in and and more and more I'm hearing from folks, hey, that's really neat. We learned something cool from you while we were watching. And then I actually took the ASP.NET workshop that we do at Dev Intersection. I adapted it a little bit, changed it up, and invited some of our friends, John Galloway, Julie mm-hmm. Lerman, Shane mm-hmm. Boyer, to help present it. We broke it up and we did it one full day. Just, you know, let's talk about it and go through. Everybody took a little piece and we had a lot of fun with it. A week or so later, I got a message in a chat room. Somebody said, you know, I watched the workshop. I followed up and learned a little bit and I applied for a job and I got my first software development job. Wow. After watching some of that stuff and following up with Virtual Academy and some other things, I was like, 
wow. Yeah, that's, you know, that's great. That's really cool. Proof is right there. Yeah. What more do you want? Exactly. So the boss is still paying attention and said, and okay, you know, here's a report. Here's how we're doing. We've got some numbers. We've got some traction here. Is this something that we want to continue doing? And they said, well, you know, keep pushing it a little bit. You know, here's some other topics, some ideas that we think would, would be interesting to make sure that you cover. And I said, well, how about, can I bring it to build? Right. And I, I saw you, Richard and Carl at build. Yep. And I, I ran a couple sessions at build and people started to notice. Mm. And going back to the boss, he said, you know, we have the Visual Studio channel. That might be something interesting to work with, might be something to build on and do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And since about the build time frame, we've been building out some content so that we can really take, take this type of medium that we have here on Twitch, where I, I think of this more like where what you're doing with a podcast really is that NPR, pre, you know, very highly produced, you know, had great content, not at all edited down. No, no, no. No, nope, not at no all. Need, not a bit. Not at all. Jeff, I got to interrupt you for just a moment for this very important message. Save the date for .NET Conf 2018, September 12th through 14th. .NET Conf is a free three-day virtual developer event co-organized by the .NET community and Microsoft. Over the course of three days, you can enjoy a wide selection of live sessions that feature speakers from the community and .NET product teams. These are the experts in their field, and .NET Conf is a chance to learn, ask questions live, and get inspired for your next software project. You will learn to build for web, mobile, cloud, desktop games, services, libraries, and more for a variety of platforms and devices, all with .NET. There are sessions for everyone, no matter if you are starting out or a seasoned engineer. Expect presentations on .NET Core and ASP.NET Core, C Sharp, F Sharp, Azure, Visual Studio, Xamarin, and much more. Head to www.dotnetconf.net. That's .netconf.net to learn more and tune in. And we're back. It's Richard Campbell, Carl Franklin. It's .NET Rocks. We're talking to Jeff Fritz. We're streaming live on Twitch and apparently Mixer too. Yeah. No, we're not on Mixer today. We're just on Twitch. No? Ah. Okay. So keeping it simple. Don't want to make it more complicated than it needs to be. Yes. Oh, yes. So, but we are on the Visual Studio channel here on Twitch. Nice. So, what do you do on the channel? Like, how do you engage an audience? Like, you can't just sit there and ask ask for questions. Is that even work? No. You've got to kind of work on something. So, we do. That's that's a great point. So, I I started off working on just some some widgets, some things that are great for using here on on Twitch or on Mixer that that show some interesting things that are going on. I even put together like a little GitHub, I call it the scoreboard, but it's more like a ticker that goes by the top of the screen when I'm writing code mm -hmm. that shows here's everybody who's contributed, right? Here's- Nice. Right? I want to celebrate those folks in, in our community that are working together on an open source project and everything I work on is open source. Everybody can see, see the code. It's all out on GitHub. Hmm. And if people want to submit questions, I've got a Discord chat room that's- that's kind of like Slack, but it's the one that the gamers really favor. Right. But I've got a Discord chat room. Folks can can talk to me on, post questions, and I'll come back to them here on Twitch. Mm -hmm. But I've got I've got projects that we work on. Even one, I'm going to go back to Dev Intersection again. We then I started with Shane Boyer back at Dev Intersection Orlando. That was March. Yeah, in the Spring Show in Orlando. Yeah, the Spring Show. That's right. And Shane and I started on stage, and it was a, a simple wiki. You know, I want a little CMS, simple ASP.NET Core, Razor Pages, runs everywhere. And you only got an hour. And we only had an hour. So we started it, and we said, okay, we have a live audience that were asking questions. We had an audience on Twitch that was asking questions, and we handed it off, and it's all in GitHub, and we've slowly had folks contribute to it. Lots of pull requests. I've got folks in Australia in New Zealand, in Europe, North America, that have contributed pull requests. Mm -hmm. And I have their names go by on that ticker during my normal shows. Nice. Yeah. Really cool stuff. We ran an architecture workshop in July. I call it a workshop, but it's eight hours, and we have a bunch of MVPs and Microsoft folks join for an hour each. And each one of them took a, took a piece of that core wiki project. And that's what we call it, core wiki. And they each grabbed it and they said, well, here, let me show you how to apply this piece of 
architecture concept to it. So we had Miguel Castro show us how to write some extensibility capabilities. Nice. Steve Smith talked to us about clean architecture, right? Julie Lerman talked about domain-driven design. So, you know, we talked about all of these things and how they can make our software better. So coming off of that for the last month or so, we've been slowly introducing those concepts to the project. Mm -hmm. And consequently, then some of our viewers, I call them pair programmers, mm -hmm. have been joining in and either in the chat room saying, oh, that, I don't like the way that that feels, you know, that, that doesn't feel like good architecture. Or they'll submit a pull request and say, hey, I gave a shot of, of applying Jimmy Bogard's mediator library and seeing how that can improve the project. It's almost like mob programming, isn't it? Yes. Yes, Carl. That's, that's exactly what it feels like. Woody Zool would be really happy about this. It's been very cool. Yeah. Yeah. I see, what, 28 contributors to CoreWiki now. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and right at the bottom is, is Shane Boyer. So clearly he's slacking. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been talking to Shane and we've been looking at in September, is there an opportunity to bring a whole bunch of great cloud modules into this so that you can optionally say, you know what, instead of using, we're using SQLite so anybody can download and install and run it inside of a Docker container, mm -hmm, right. but maybe you want to use Cosmos DB. So maybe we take a, a show and we, and we demonstrate, here's how to use Cosmos DB and integrate it with the project. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And an interesting idea. I mean, one of the challenges here is that they, it might just be an option. Like you, you want to be able to run it on-prem as well. But that idea that you could modulate this and say, okay, well, here's a way to insert Cosmos DB and what it does for us. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, you know what? We want to do notifications, but let's do them with an, with an Azure function. Okay. Sure. Mm. Here's how to add that in. Yeah. You can cloud this up pretty heavily. It's very cool. Yeah. It's very interesting what you're doing. Yeah. So are you feeling like you're reaching Twitch folks that hadn't really paid any attention to .NET or are you bringing .NET folks to Twitch? It's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. it, it really is. The number of folks that pop into the chat room and say, hey, what's this editor you're using? That doesn't, that doesn't look like brackets yeah. or Atom. Mm -hmm. You know, I did the whole month of May. I called it May is for Macs. And I did the whole month using Visual Studio Code on a Mac. Right. And people are seeing all the Mac you know, Chrome and things around the screen. They're like, what editor is this? This doesn't look like something I would normally see people writing code with on a Mac. Mm -hmm. I was using Visual Studio Code and we had a whole bunch of people learn how to use Visual Studio Code on a Mac. Very nice. We just know that it exists, right? Exactly. Yeah. That, that thing is there. Yeah, yeah. By placing our categories properly here on Twitch, and, and Twitch has a, a, an amazing set of categories and tags that they put on, they call them communities now, mm -hmm. but Twitch is changing up their structure a little bit. But we tag the stream so that people can find it in the hierarchy and watch the show. Yeah. It's really gotten some new folks to tune in, you know, when they might not normally, you know, be watching a show or listening to a podcast. We have folks that, that tune in and they'll have the, the show playing in their team room. And then whenever something comes up that they're interested in, somebody will jump on chat and ask a question hmm. and kind of probe me along. That's the thing about this medium is I can be very interactive with it. Sure. Yeah. Well, it strikes me that ultimately the digression is the value. Yes. Yes. You have to go in working on a project, right? There has to be something you're working on. Mm -hmm. But those digressions are where people are really going to learn something new, that they can interact with you enough and you go, oh, well, hey, let me show you this. I mean, how many times have you been using Visual Studio and doing some keyboard shortcut and something like, how did, how, did, how did you do that? Right. It's been the same with our show, too. I mean, the digressions. Oh, yeah. We, you can't just go by the topic of the show because there's, mm -hmm. we talk about everything whenever it comes up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that I've jumped off to. We've got folks in the chat room asking questions about Blazor. Oh, it'd be great to talk about Blazor at some point. Mm -hmm. And yeah. fine, you know, I'll answer questions about that. It's... I look at it as if I wanted to write an application and get it done lickety split, I wouldn't be sharing it with you yeah, and right. answering your questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Remember, remember we used to measure our productivity by, in, you know, fewest number of interruptions? <laughs> <laughs> then you strap the internet on your face. I'm thinking you just like interrupt me, please. Yeah. Well, I, I got an interruption because Richard, guess what time it is now? Uh, it must be that happy time again. Yeah, it's time for us to have a little fun. Ready? A little? Okay, Google. 
Restart my phone. Ah, Jeff, looks like the chat room is emptying out. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> That's terrible, <laughs> terrible. Really, they'd be... 98, 97, 96, 95, 94. Too funny. <laughs> Chopping oh. like flies. Oh, you're killing me. You're killing me, Smalls. It's actually time to give away a free conference pass to Tech Bash, October 2 through 5, and up to four nights at the Kalahari Resort in Pocono Manor, Pennsylvania, for the event Compliments of Progress Telerik. To register, visit techbash.netrocks.com. But first, let me tell you about the most comprehensive developer toolkit for building modern apps on the market today, Telerik DevCraft. With more than 1,100 Telerik.net and Kendo UI JavaScript components and controls, you can easily build modern, high-performant web, mobile, and desktop apps, as well as chatbots. The toolset also includes reporting solutions, automated testing and productivity tools, and comes with a range of support options. New this year is a free online training program for all license holders. With this, alongside thousands of demos with source code, comprehensive documentation, and a full assortment of Visual Studio templates, you'll be up and running with the Progress Telerik and Kendo UI tools in no time. Download a free 30-day trial now at telerik.com slash download. Well, all right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner, Richard, is Paul Cooper. Congratulations, Paul. Golf clap for you. So Paul just won a free ticket to Tech Bash just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you'd like to be a member, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join the club. We have thousands of members all over the world. And every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club, but you got to sign up to win. All right, Jeff. Yes. I don't know how long it's been, but it's been a while. Seven months. Yeah. January, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Anything new on your technology to-do list for $5,000? So I'm, I'm at a point here where, where I'm building out the, the Fritz Studios. Right. You can see, I mean, I've got a, this little portable green screen behind me, and I've seen some other folks on Twitch. They actually painted the walls in their, their spare bedroom that they're, they've turned into their home studio. They've painted mm -hmm. two of the walls green. That's dedication. Well, then what they do is they have different scenes that they can walk into, <laughs> and it's whatever they sub out in the background. It's all a lie. Hey, look at me. I'm in the garage and look at the cool sports car I have. It's all nice. photos yeah. that they've put over there. Yeah. That's pretty funny. But uh, painting the walls isn't $5,000. No. no. And you got to know that we just did a show with James Montemagno where he said for his 5000 he wants just Fritz's rig. So. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, chat room, my rig isn't five grand. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. It's, it's not. Seven. It's seven. <laughs> It's out of your league. It's now I'm on the spot. No, no, I've been slowly building over time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I would like five thousand dollars worth of baseball caps hats. that I can wear on the next. That's a lot of hats. <laughs> That's a lot of hats. No. So I've I actually only spent about fifteen hundred on the machine that I'm using, and and I spent about five hundred of that on a video card. Right. Yeah. But I do want to soundproof the room. Mm. You know, because just outside the door over here, and you can't see it, I'm pointing over this way, and pointing works really good on radio. Yeah, no, oh, I love your, love your gestures on radio. <sighs> ATSacoustics.com. Real traps, baby. Yeah, real traps will get you so far, but ATS Acoustics has got yeah. a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I need to soundproof the door, because the kids' rooms are at the other end of the hallway, and a funny thing happens when the kids are home and mom's unhappy. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's quiet. Nothing. For five grand, you could almost get a sound booth. Like, that's in the ballpark. Soundsuckers.com. They're, they're yeah. actually five grand a piece, the four by six yeah. that I'm in right Just, here. You could put yourself in a little foamy box, dude. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. Hmm. I was going to get some panels to put on the walls. Yeah. What if you just put a room inside your room? Well, you know, but that now you have to paint all the foam green, and that's going to take yeah. away from its soundproofiness. So the the other two walls behind me are the outside walls, and I've got mm. I've got pretty good distance there to the other folks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
You either need to have a small tight room like this or a a big room that's soundproofed because you're going to need you you need space in between, you know, to light yeah. the green screen. Yes. Yeah. So what I've actually done, so all right, not in the $5,000, but changing topics. What I've actually done, so I I actually have shop lights, clamp-on shop lights that I bought at Home Depot for five bucks. Yeah, I have one right here. <laughs> Is that what you guys are using? It's it's a little clamp-on light. That's it. Yeah. Eh, mine's actually cheaper looking than that. Yours is, it looks like it's actually, yeah. A nice light. I got mine from Lowe's and it actually makes a nice counterweight too. Oh, and it just went off. There you go. So here, for the folks that are in the, that are in the chat room that are watching, right? That's what mine looks like. It literally is a little aluminum light. Yeah. And I bounce it off the wall in front of me. And it gives you a fill. So it lights up me and a little bit of the green screen. And then to finish out the green screen, Carl's gone. Hang on. Yeah. No, the light broke. The light broke. <laughs> <laughs> Pulled the light out. So. There you go. That's what I get for pulling it down. To finish out the green screen, what I do is I, I bought a little set of LED lights, mm-hmm. RGB LED lights for like 20 bucks on, on Amazon. And then mm-hmm. it's a little remote control like this. Nice. And I just turned it to green. And I have them filling in the green screen so that when I am broadcasting and I want to drop out the background, so I'm literally sitting inside a Visual Studio. Yeah. That's what I use. We've seen that. I tried looking at using the camera, right? Some cameras can automatically drop out the background for you, but it's not crisp. It's not... No, it's not crisp. It's, it's not perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So the chroma key features of tools like I use OBS takes care of that for me. Open broadcast system. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to be the way. Yep. So I took your advice and I did some streaming of cooking demonstrations for the keto world at carlsketokitchen.com. And I went to Twitch and YouTube and Periscope and Facebook all at the same yeah. time through restream.io. Thanks to you. Great service. And your expert guidance. It, it really went well. Cool. That is cool. Oh, that's awesome. There's definitely something that feels great about being able to reach reach an audience they wouldn't normally be able to see you. Sure. Right? Yeah, I agree. The trick is to give something that is important in visuals. Like, I'm not a big fan of the talking head, like what we're doing here per se. You generally mm-hmm. want something else going on. But right. coding is just interesting to, to look at that way. Yeah. Wait, are you pumping out like a 1080p stream? Yep. We're 1080p right now up to Twitch. Right. And then Twitch has some funny things that happen where once you have a certain number of viewers, they'll start to run the encoders for you and they'll transcode the video on the fly to different size video hmm. for other folks. I'm just trying to imagine the code still being legible. Like it sounds like you almost have to go into presenter mode and turn the fonts up and things like that. I do that by default. I turn the fonts up. And part of that is just because it's easier for my, my older eyes to see now. Yeah. You've got the old eyes. Okay. We'll go, go with that. <laughs> yeah. We'll we'll absolutely go with that. And uh it it works pretty good. I haven't I haven't had too many issues. Twitch doesn't prioritize you unless you're one of their bigger streamers that they call you a partner at that point. Right. But you do start to get a little bit of priority on the encoders when you have a good number of of viewers nice. watching you on a regular basis. I'm going to grab a question from the chat room, which was uh, from Gareth Hubble, who said, I have to ask you about your rainbow beard challenge. Oh, man. Here we go. All right. Yes. We're going to have the .NET Rocks audience chiming in on this now. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so for the folks that are that are watching, I have I have a logo that somebody suggested for me, and you can see it here on my mug. And it's it says, works on my machine, ship it. It's kind of backwards because I'm. <laughs> awesome. I, I got the idea for printing a logo on a mug from another show. I can't. I, I can't fathom what show. Nobody has it. That's never a good idea. Never a good idea. <laughs> and I showed off when when the mug first arrived. I put a picture on Twitter of me drinking from the mug and it, and stupid me. I did it in front of my green screen. Right. And and one of our friends. I'm not sure if he's in the chat room now. No, he's not started swapping out the background, photoshopping it because it's on a perfect green background. Sure. And had ah. a picture of me sipping from my mug as a dinosaur from Jurassic Park was chasing me. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. The gifts. Oh, yes. Oh, the gifts. And it's the gift that keeps on gifting. Nice. <laughs> and somebody, one of, the, one of the ladies that watches, she's Moz in the chat room. 
she said, I want to color in that beard. I want to make that a rainbow colored beard. And I said, that's kind of silly. Why would I ever have a rainbow beard? And she found some pictures of folks that had, or gentlemen that had rainbow colored beards. And she, right. see, she, she said, see, this would look really cool. I said, I would, I would never do that. Oh, sure. That would look totally <laughs> great. And I said, look, <laughs> and I'm looking at the total number of followers I had at the time. And it was at the time it was about 2,500. I said, look, if we can double that before Halloween, I'll go ahead and dye my beard rainbow color. Hmm. Nice. And they said, sure, let's do it. Let, we'll help you get there. I was like, oh, no. So, all right, fine. So I made it a thing. And now I have one of the widgets that we built during my initial pass at, at writing some code on stream was a follower goal widget. So I, I can retheme that with whatever colors I want and with whatever goal numbers I want, and it'll track my followers. So during my normal streams, I have this, this follower goal, and it looks like that normal thermometer you see whenever there's a pledge drive or something. Sure. But when I hit 5,000 followers, if I hit 5,000 before, I think I said October 20th is the date I'm looking for. If we hit that 5,000 for Halloween week, which also happens to be right after TwitchCon. TwitchCon. Yes, yes, TwitchCon. Because apparently that's a thing. That is a thing. But they don't have .NET presenters there typically. But we'll uh, we'll dye the old beard here rainbow colored. So that's what we're love it pushing towards. So Twitch TV C sharp Fritz. If if we get five thousand followers, do you think anybody wants to watch me create a music to code by? Yes, uh, live on Twitch. Yes, absolutely, dude. Something that people would like. I'll just do an informal poll. As a guy who has sat in your studio while you were working on music, like I've had my private Twitch stream. Totally. Yeah. I think it's fascinating the way you create music. It's pretty fun. It's very fun. Very much fun. It's fun. Yeah. Our friend Brady Gaster has started a, a stream where he has his DJ equipment all set up at home in his, in his extra room that he has set up so that he can work on music while he's, you know, not interrupting the rest of the family. Hmm. And he's starting to, you know, mix and, and write music live on Twitch. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of folks that, that do that. Set the category for your stream to music and wait do you see how many people tune in. Yeah. And gosh, I, I've got to call out, you know, while we have you here on, on stream, Carl, thank you so much for, for giving us permission to listen to Music to Code by. Oh, right. While we write code. That's right. Here on this stream, we've gone through a number of the different songs and the comments that I get in the chat room from folks. You know, this is this is really cool music. Are you, are you intending to put me into a trance? I've had people say. <laughs> well, yes. Yes, we are. <laughs> kind of. We want you to focus. Yeah. Subscribe to the app. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's subliminal marketing in there. No, I realize, I realize Blue now is an automatic trigger into focus now for me. Like I've listened to it enough times that it's literally two phrases in and you're there. Yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. I so, I still I use it myself when I'm writing code. I you know, I have a day job writing code again and it's a lot of fun. So yeah, I'm listening to it all the time. Seventeen tracks now. Yeah. Yeah. So and Gareth here in the chat room is saying this stream sold him on music to code by. Huh. Bought the collection rather than the subscription. Yeah. Yeah, you can do it either way. Mm hmm So yeah. yeah, great stuff. We we really enjoy that. Well, thank you. It's playing enough in the background that people can't clip it, right? And Yeah, yeah. They'll just have to listen to this voice over it. Right. I find that people who really want to use it just get it, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have had people ask me if I would, you know, show them how I do research for a geek out. I just can't imagine how to make that interesting. Uh, you know, that would be amazing. Uh, just you surfing the web and, and talking to yourself. Hmm. Let me see what that's all about. Yeah. You don't have to necessarily read it, but... Yeah. But I read really fast. Yeah, you may have to slow down a little to everybody else's speed. You've, you've seen me do this, right? Like how quickly I pull stuff together. Yeah, I have. So. Yeah. so, and that kind of leads into some of the ideas that we're kicking around for different shows that we want to have on our, our Visual Studio channel that we're launching here in September. Mm -hmm. So, we've got .NET Conf coming up. And I, I think there's a .NET Conf advertisement maybe around one of these recordings. I've, I've been listening to .NET Rocks and I think some of those advertisements have been on here. Yeah, we've been doing .NET Conf ads uh, every Thursday in August. Cool. Yeah, that, that break I did at the 20, that's where it goes. <laughs> there we go. So 
.NET Conf is going to be broadcast live on the Visual Studio channel, and because of some of the cool things that we've been doing on Twitch, I thought, wouldn't it be great if we did 24 hours of .NET Conf over Twitch, every time zone, every continent? <laughs> now, this is a Twitch thing, right? Yeah. Yes. The gamers that play 24 and 36 hours. Look, this is... And look... I'm the guy who's harnessed my OCD for the forces of good. <laughs> this is not a healthy practice. Like. So a, I've taken a lot of inspiration from a lot of our gamer friends that are out there on Twitch, right? Mm -hmm. I've, I, I use some of the widgets that they use so that whenever somebody clicks the follow button when I'm writing code, I have a little alarm that comes up and it, and it says, you know, Richard Campbell is now following you on Twitch. Mm -hmm. But you have an alarm that goes with it. So I have I have that Steve Ballmer clip of him yelling, developers, developers, developers. Right. And Steve's greeted about 3,200 folks at this point. Nice. Yeah. So I've taken some of those things that the gamers do, and it, it makes it interesting. It makes it a little bit more engaging. And the 24-hour thing is something the gamers do when they hit mm. a certain goal, you know? Oh, we had 1,000 new followers in the month, so we're going to run a 24-hour gaming stream playing PUBG, playing Fortnite, some of these games, you know? Playing a game for 24 hours, that's a lot of caffeine. It's horrifying, right? Yeah. Like, it's how I learned to hate a game. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And then part of me just wonders if the people watch this, because they're it's like watching NASCAR. Like, you're waiting for the accident. Mm. Yes. For that. Wes themselves or loses their mind and just starts smashing their head on the keyboard. Like, it's, oh, yeah. Ah, it's so odd. You know, and, and the funny thing is, like, the computing industry and startup culture has been in a place for a long time where it was like you work 24 hours a day, da, 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 da. And we're just starting to have this conversation about a little bit healthier practices and a mm. little bit more of this, you know, better engagement and better rest. And then the gamer thing comes along. Yeah. So it's a one-off thing. It's a stunt, right, to, to do something cool that brings people in. I did a, I did a whole weekend mm -hmm. stream for charity. With the Philadelphia area streamers, we call ourselves PH16. Hmm. And it was for Child's Play to support the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. We had shifts. You know, we had our friend Brent Schooley right. from Twilio. Yep. He's Chef Brent on Twitch. And he was hosting a bunch of us at his house and he had a couple rooms set up and we just rotated through and a couple people would show up and we'd do our, our shift playing a couple games. We'd take off, some other folks would wake up and they would do their shift playing a couple games. And it was great. We raised a couple thousand dollars for Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and it was a nice model for, for a weekend of streaming. That seems way more sustainable. Yes. So, and that's what we're doing for .NET Conf. Mm -hmm. We're going to bring in for one hour, every hour, somebody from a different time zone to give a presentation. You know what it reminds me of, Richard? Remember the, uh, mm -hmm. what was it, the live weekend that we did? We did a long weekend of 16 hours a day for three days in a row. Yeah. And we were just completely burned. I think you called into one of those, Jeff. I did. Yeah. Yeah. We were just completely burned out silly by the end of the day. We did not get 48 shows from it. That's for sure. No. There was, <laughs> there was all, it, I mean, the end of the first day, I think was pretty solid, but the end of the second day and definitely the, like the last three hours of the third day, I think we were just down to fart jokes. There was nothing else left. Like, that's all we had. We did have comfortable chairs, though, didn't we? Yes. No, you know, it was very plush. You were yeah. laid out with the microphone sort of hovering yeah. in your face. We had the chat room up on the screen in front of us. It was, it was kind of fun. Yeah. I don't know if I would not want to do that again. That's probably why we haven't done it again. Yeah. Well, what was interesting also is when you get that many shows, we got so far ahead yeah. that we ended up having to cut a couple because they were now wrong. Mm. Yeah. And one of the ones that we cut was Chris Sells in the Oslo show, if you yep. recall. That's right. Because I, that was when Oslo was still a thing. I think it was just Chris was on the show, but I took Chris to task. was like, it's been oh. four years of you leaking about this thing and talking about this thing. <laughs> Where is it? What happened? What are you guys doing? And it, enough that at the, by the end of the show, Chris said, let me know when you're going to publish that so I could tell PR. And I was like, <laughs> no, we're not, we're not going to publish the show. Don't worry. I feel that. What happened between that time was they canceled Oslo. It got shut down. Yep. Now it's, now it's just mean, right? Now it's nothing. Right. So we just, we threw it. There's no reason to publish that. Sure. Yeah. Chris and Don came on the show years before that and talked about yeah. Oslo. Well, it was four years. Yeah. Also, was my proof that if you're talking about something and after the second year you haven't shipped it, it's not shipping. Yeah. <laughs> There's a threshold. 
Didn't that happen a bit with Roslyn? Well, Roslyn turned into fusion power, right? Like it's coming out <laughs> next year, and next year, and next year, and next year. <laughs> yeah, but it was worth the wait. It was. Yeah, it was. But Roslyn didn't start out as a cross-platform open source project, right? It was no. really a fix for, it's sort of a fundamental of programming languages that you write your compiler in your own language. Mm. And they never got around to doing that for so many years. And then it finally, it was kind of a sore point mm -hmm. where it's like, there's a disconnect here. We've got to fix this. And it was just a side project for the longest time. And then when, then the I, of course, you can see I'm pulling out my history of .NET stuff. When core became a thought, Rosalind had a mission and then it mm. that moved very quickly. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I'm being prompted here in the chat room. I need to mention regarding languages. So I've I've always wanted to learn F sharp. Mm -hmm. And I started a thing on Fridays. And I, I haven't done it in a few weeks. Just a bunch of stuff has come up and has derailed it. But uh, I started doing F sharp Fridays here on the stream. Nice. Nice. And nobody does F sharp on Twitch. Wow. And it gave us an opportunity to talk about F Sharp, to learn about it together and kind of explore some of the different things you could do with it. Hmm. So that's that's been an interesting way to to learn something and do something different with the medium. So Yeah, no kidding. And I know you know, over and over again we've talked to folks who said that getting F sharp in the head and really starting to think functionally changed the way they wrote C sharp. Yes. Yes. Without question. Mm-hmm. So I, I, there's all kinds of opportunities to do different things, to still learn technology, still be close to some of the things that we do as software developers, as technologists. There's Brent in the chat room. Brent does a great thing on, on Mondays where he's cooking, right? Just like you were doing, Carl. Yeah, yeah. It, they run a show called Cooking with Heat, mm -hmm. you know, and there's all kinds of different tech references and things that happen during that. And that's pretty cool. That is cool. Some of our friends do these daily link blogs, you know, where, right, like Alvin Ashcraft and Chris Alcock, right, the morning dew and the morning brew, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it's okay to look at that site, you know, but what if I want to actually hear somebody talk about it, do a little bit of analysis on it a little bit further than, you know, here's the links. This was the whole idea behind DNR TV when I started that, which is, you know, not a one-way lecture, but it's an interactive thing. It wasn't live, of course, but but it's very much the same idea, which is you want to ask questions and have people answer with code. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Or ask questions about the code they're writing while they're writing it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I think there's opportunity for both of those types of shows, right? Talk about links and do a really focused, pre-programmed mm. and hardened set of demos, almost a lab. Yeah. And be able to take questions, have people download the materials and, and do a very instructional thing. More than just, hey, let's write some code together and contribute together on something. Right. So uh, I see that there's all kinds of different learning models and something that and I'm name dropping all over the place here. But this really is a community thing that I'm trying to drive and, and help happen here. But, but something that I learned from Kathleen Dollard back at that fall Dev Intersection show was, that folks learn the most when they're watching somebody else and they're trying to find the mistakes. Right. Hmm. And that's the biggest thing that our chat room does for us on, on the Twitch streams when we're writing code is, and, and why I call them pair programmers, is they'll call out, oh, Jeff, you forgot a semicolon. You, you missed an extra right. bracket there or, yeah. or a parenthesis. And... To get that feedback immediately from somebody else who's watching you. Before you noticed it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I know they're paying attention to what I'm doing. Right. They're helping me not make that mistake. And then they may submit a pull request later and say, oh, you wrote this code, but here's some unit tests to help support it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's really powerful. Yeah. Hey, you know, I was talking to the Pope the other day, and the Pope told me something very important. The Pope said, Carl... If you never do one thing, you should never name drop. <laughs> Don't do that. The Pope said this. Yeah. You know, as you do. As the Pope does. That brought the show to a screeching halt. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Blow that up. <laughs> nice. So we get to this point, if folks want to, you know, everyone's got an idea, put it out on Twitch. It's worthwhile. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm recruiting some of our uh, MVP friends to help us out with, with shows on the Visual Studio channel. I'm always happy to syndicate other folks. 
I see our friend Kevin Griffin's in the chat room. His user group and and my local user group, philly.net, have started streaming their user group meetings. Mm. So if you can't make it to their user group, or maybe you live a couple states away, or even on the other side of the world, Mm. and there's a good topic that they're talking about, you can tune in, watch that speaker at that user group that you can't attend, and learn something and, and give them some feedback at the same time. Awesome. So, Jeff, what's next on your to-do list? So, next on my to-do list, I have I have a couple of workshop type of events that I'm going to be running on stream here that I've been planning for the fall. There's a big one coming up in September that I can't talk about yet, but we're going to be running that one about a week before .NET Conf. And .NET Conf is where I've been focusing a lot of my energy, Yeah, getting that virtual event off the ground. We have Ignite, and I'm hoping to do some more live streaming at Ignite. But really, I've been focused on on streaming, building a community, and making this into something that's more than just more than just people playing games. More than mm. you know, give that level of interactivity and demonstration that we want in a blog post. Yeah, that people can ask questions about and not have to wait for a comment to come back. You know, a week or two later. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to engage and grow this as a medium for developers to learn, to to engage, and to have fun. Awesome. That's so great. Thanks, Jeff. It's always a pleasure talking to you on our show, and it's nice to be on yours as well. Thank you. I really appreciate you joining me here. We've had a lot of folks tune in and throughout the, uh, the afternoon here. Yeah, despite me resetting their phones. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Lord, I apologize. <laughs> All right. Thanks again. And we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a, a